Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Fago Maradian here at the United States Institute of Peace in Washington, D.C. We're recovering the sixth annual European Union's Common Security and Defense Policy Conference in partnership with the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And we're honored to have with us the Director General of the uh, European Union's Military Committee, uh, Finnish Army Lieutenant General Esa Pulkinen. Sir, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you very much for, for inviting me here. Uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure. I want to start uh, first, you know, uh, as, as we heard at the uh, opening, uh, ambassador to the uh, EU's ambassador to the United States, David O'Sullivan, sort of said, defense is back, uh, saying that it's on the agenda very, very firmly. As um, the top military leader in the European Union alliance, what are the top security challenges that the EU has to prepare for as you look into the strategic future? I was most... Uh pleased to hear both Heather Conley and, and Ambassador Sullivan mention about the name of General Marshall because uh, uh, the Marshall plan has actually the 17th anniversary today and I would say if we don't exactly need the Marshall plan but we need the spirit of the of the Marshall also to, to strengthen the transatlantic cooperation. Transatlantic cooperation is something that is seen as in question now. Uh, the President of the United States in particular not having invoked Article 5 or, or specifically endorsing Article 5 at the Article 5 memorial in the new uh, headquarters. Some of the comments the President made as a candidate but also since office um, about negative comments about the EU has some questioning the future of the Transatlantic Alliance. From as the standpoint of the top EU military officer, yeah. what are, is there that sparked, for example, Angela Merkel to be critical and say Europe has to take its own fate into its own hands. Is there a likelihood, are you concerned, that NATO becomes weaker? And if NATO becomes weaker, then the EU has to stand up to pick up more of the burden. I don't see that issue in, in, from that perspective. I think the alliances will, 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 will stay alive and will, will be even stronger in the future. And, and on the EU side, it's one of our responsibilities to, to strengthen the, also the uh, NATO's European pillar and that we are going going to do. So the messages that I hear from your senior military leaders in Europe are, are more encouraging and supporting on, 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 on NATO and supporting also uh, the EU and, and cooperation with, uh, between the United States and, and European Union on, at military level. You just got back from the State Department, actually. We were waiting for you to get back from a key uh, series of meetings you had over there this morning. Um, talk to us a little bit about the, what the message that you're getting is, and more broadly, what's the collaborative relationship you want between the United States, the EU, and also with your NATO counterparts? I would say that the messages were extremely supportive that we heard uh, today from states. We discussed on, on African security and, and there actually we have common challenges and, and uh, we need to co cooperate with the US, uh, with other interlocutors as well, notably African Union, United Nations. But that will actually require quite a lot of, lot of work for us. But the attitude is absolutely positive and, and we, uh, uh, we share all the views and, and we actually share the challenges and, 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 and hopefully we will have a better, better responses uh, together tomorrow. That's a long, long lasting uh, commitment. Let me take you to the question of defense investment. You mentioned that there is greater commitment. Um, you know, the fortunate thing is 22 of the NATO countries are also EU countries. Uh, 29 NATO countries now that Montenegro yesterday uh, joined the alliance, 28 in the European Union <laughs> for the time being until yeah. the UK uh, regrettably leaves, and I do want to follow yeah. up on that. But as somebody who's also trying to shape these investment plans, what are the priorities from an EU perspective where these nations need to invest, but also avoid duplication. And I understand that that's a little bit of Jorge Domecq's job at, at, ED, at the European Defense Agency. But from your perspective, where does that additional money need to be invested? Well, um, first I would like to mention that, of course, military is on both on NATO side and EU side. We are the ones actually who set up the military requirements. And then the ED8 and the others are going to implement, of course, there are certain political issues and priorities, but, but certainly if you look at the fact that uh, we have a single set of forces in, in Europe and of course the NATO is the organization that runs the capability development. Uh, we have a single set of forces and, and, and I think that is a guarantee that we are not going to, to do any unnecessary, any unnecessary duplications. But what is uh, important now to, to work uh, forward is to, is to strengthen of course the uh, European responsibilities and European responsibilities on 
on, on also investing better on capabilities. And there, actually, if everything goes well, and the, really the Commission and, and member states uh, take seriously all of the requirements that come, shortfalls are, by the way, the same from NATO and EU. I mean, there's, that is not a big surprise. So that we certainly uh, can come out with the better contribution for the, for the European defence and also to contribute to the uh, NATO's European pillar, notably through the EU, uh, through the NATO member nations, European member nations. Improving the planning process is, is critical because one of the criticisms of the EU and almost any multinational operation yeah. is how long it takes for that operation to stand up. You were in charge of Atlanta, the key yeah. anti-piracy mission that was uh, off the coast of Africa, yeah. very, very successful mission. Um, what are some of the lessons you learned from Atlanta that you're applying to a reform policy planning process that gives greater agility in the ability of EU nations to respond to matters that are not necessarily maybe a NATO level matter, but is more of an EU matter? Once again, excellent, excellent questions. And I think really uh, Atalanta deserves our attention. And, and, and Atalanta operation commander and staff have really devoted their time in order to find out in the case Atalanta mandate will be will be will expire like is planned. Uh, to look actually what are the elements of Atalanta that should be retained. One is of course all these cooperative mechanisms that have been uh, established during the Atalanta shade, shared uh, awareness and deconfliction that is now applied also in the Mediterranean between the uh, EU and, and, and NATO and, and uh, US naval forces. Um, that's one ele element. Uh, the other important element is uh, is a legal framework. We call it legal finish. Where actually, the EU is the organisation that actually can have the legally binding agreements with the with the with the different different nations. And we have currently a couple of uh, couple of uh, legal agreements, legally binding agreements with African nations that uh, goes for the for the um, prosecution and the imprisonment of, of, the, of, the, of, of the pirates. That is really, really very helpful and deserve, deserves actually the preservation. Um, and uh, of course, there's one um, very innovative uh, element. Uh, it's called uh, MSC HOA. Um, it's established in, in, in headquarters in Northwood. Actually, it's, it's kind of the self-sustaining C2 element, where the, actually the commercial uh, ships provide information through the uh, that MS HOA uh, available for the for the other interlocutors, including you know, also naval ships, which really is something that we need in future to very seriously consider. Um, you are uh, a man with many many jobs. Uh, you have three full time jobs, depending on how you want to slice it. And your congratulations about to get a fourth uh, full time job, which is the overseeing of the three key uh, EU uh, peacekeeping operations that are going on in Mali, Central African Republic, but also in Somalia, yeah. which is uh, outgrowth of the of the Atalanta mission. You're obviously there are a thousand EU troops that are yeah. connected with that mission, but you also are working very closely with the partners uh, all across the African yeah. continent. Um, what are the operational lessons learned from those operations that are most instructive from your perspective, both in that should shape spending by member nations, but also other um, lessons that you're learning to apply as you prepare to do other kinds of operations like this, potentially on even shorter notice than you've had on, in these cases? First of all, I'm very, very happy and proud that um, even as a very senior military leader, I once again get the kind of the operational uh, commander's role for the for the training missions. All the militaries we are we are dreaming about that. So that not only being a bureaucrat, but also the having <laughs> having real troops on the on the field. But yeah, so that you're not just a staff guy anymore. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and I may use my paddle dress from time to time, even in my office, just to emphasize that fact. But but seriously, I think the. There are a number of lessons, uh, hopefully some lessons are even, even learned, but in Africa, its question is, uh, of course, cooperation with, uh, with uh, all possible stakeholders, uh, Africans and, and international organizations, uh, nations like the United States and even, even the EU, EU member states and, and the others. Uh, one um, lesson is that um, in Africa, uh, progress can be very slow and, and it's, it's, a, it's a long process, uh, 
perhaps the generation commitment, but it is it will be the uh, investment for the future, for the future of Africa, for the future of the of the Europe, and for the future of the transatlantic community. If we can improve the security situation in the, in the fragile countries, in in Africa. The other issue is that um, from uh, from European Union point of view, um, we have been training now uh, troops in in uh, military troops in in in, uh, in Somalia. Uh, Mali and now started last uh, summer in Central African Republic. We can provide a good training, but we have certain shortfalls on 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 providing equipment, even non-lethal equipment. And and by training your troops, but not providing them with the equipment and and weapons, eventually is not the most successful way way to to actually to undertake your your duties. And that's that's certainly something we 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 need to consider. And there, the help of the United States has been tremendous. I mean, in various occasions, for example, in Somalia. And what are the kinds of equipment that you need? Because from a frontline military perspective, some of this equipment is not exactly the most sophisticated gear that you need. No, actually, if we, if we talk about the normal gear, I mean, we, we need even boots, uniforms, tents. We, we, we need all and everything, actually, for the sustainment of, of, the, of the troops. And lethal material is not the biggest headache we have because the uh, light arms the troops uh, may require, is uh, they are a lot in the world. As a legacy of the Second World War, it's a more question of how you do legally um, manage to manage to do the business in such a way that you know the weapons are really the right one and they will be under the supervision and control of respective authorities in, in different countries. And let me take you to the question of uh, Brexit. Um, EU, uh, UK has been a key member of the European Union, certainly one of the militarily most powerful members, uh, and has been one that, even in an EU context, has tended to be engaged in action, yeah. as many nations have, but has stood with France, for example, as being among the more active members of the, of the, of the, of the yeah. European Union. What are the implications and what are the agreements that you want to strike with the UK so that Brexit does not have any lingering security implication yeah. for the European Union. Of course, the fact is that uh, once uh, UK is leaving, 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 most likely the EU, it's not leaving the Europe, and uh, and the UK will contribute to European security. Of course, as, as, a, as a member state or nation, but also through through NATO, and that's something one should not forget. Uh, however, my heart is bleeding blood all the time when I think about the Brexit because we are we are losing losing a lot on the military side. Uh, for for example, I have uh, quite a quite a number of uh, very qualified and professional UK officers working working for my staff, which of course I wouldn't like to lose. But uh, but there are other elements as well. You know that uh, Brits are running the operation operation Atalanta for the time being from Northwood. What will be the future for that? And of course, the question of the of the capabilities: uh, Will the UK still uh, be committed on providing uh, their troops available for as a catalogue, at least in theory, for EU or not? That's a big issue. But there are a number of issues that are outstanding, outstanding, and of course, uh, I hope that you know we will have. Uh, a very constructive uh, outcome of these negotiations and Brits will stay committed also also the European defense in a way through the European Union. And let me ask you one last question. It's a threat best question and it ties into the fact that you, you are Finnish. Uh, you have a, a large neighbor you share a border with uh, that uh, historically has taken a, an interest in what goes on in Finland. But in this case, you're not a Finnish officer. You're a European yeah. officer who's serving in this in this top capacity. But what are some of the historical thinking, for example, about Russia that you think helps shape the core of potentially EU deterrent? I know that that's a NATO function, yeah. but it's also an EU function as well because it's bringing at least continentally capabilities together on that front. What are some lessons that inform how to regard uh, a, a country that is provocative, uh, increasingly involved in, in nation's internal matters, whether in the Baltics, we've seen in the United States and France, there's uh, talk about you know how a Russian involvement shaped Brexit uh, outcome, which was certainly something that uh, that Russia Russia liked. Um, you know, what what are some some lessons and, and core ways of thinking when you come into the office every day on that different strategic problem? I would say that, of course, I'm not working on my, my Finnish capacity, but uh, but if I look to Finnish history, of course, we have paid quite a quite a, we have we had to sacrifice quite a lot of of, of, the, of the outcome of the of the Second World War, actually, and our graveyards are full of the war veterans and heroes. 
but uh, we deserve some respect from the from the from the Russo Soviet Union. And that's something that's actually helped out Finland uh, on on the bilateral relations with uh, with uh, Russia and Soviet Union even. But I think the question of engagement is is there, uh, even though the sometimes the waters are quite stormy and, and conditions weather conditions are bad like that today. But uh, a certain type of dialogue need to be preserved. Of course, EU is an um, is an actor also on, 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 on Russia because the EU sanctions are there, so that the EU is in, in, in a way uh, a, a, a part of the Western Western response vis vis a vis the vis a vis the Russian Russian actions in the in the, in the Crimea and Eastern Eastern, Eastern Ukraine. But uh, you are absolutely right. Uh, the EU has a role, role to play, and uh, it goes also for the for the hybrid hybrid issues. Where actually the EU has at her disposal a lot of uh, a lot of tools uh, in the hands of Commission that could uh, strengthen, in new terms, the resilience of the of the member states of the partner states, which uh, could complement the the kind of the military preparedness and the things that like NATO 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 is doing. But like I said, I mean, it doesn't belong to my dossier at the moment. And let me, one last, I, I, I fibbed a little bit. I have one last question, and that's on terrorism. We've seen a number of attacks across the EU. Countries are struggling with how to improve their security. Um, historically, the mission between NATO has been they do the big external stuff. President Trump has been trying to get the NATO alliance focused more on a counterterrorism capacity. Mm-hmm. What are the, the roles and how the two elements of this equation work together on a counterterrorism side of things, which historically has been something that has fallen much more into the EU category necessarily than the NATO category, yeah. and and what the EU role in that is. Yeah, I would say that uh, EU has a role to play on in there. It's 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 very much on the internal security, but of course today the uh, internal external security nexus is, is quite blurry, and and and, and uh, there is a there are implications on, on, on directly from external security to internal security. But also 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 the our military actions and we are defending the European interests somewhere in the Mediterranean or Africa step in. So there is a genuine interest for us to work with uh, with NATO, United States and and uh, also to engage from the US side uh, uh, the uh, the other institutions of the European Union uh, dealing with the internal security. But uh, of course, on the military side, we stand ready to support actually uh, the U.S. And, and NATO to an extent possible. Is there any talk at all about a broader counterterrorism mission? I mean, there's always this talk about you know uh, their international community should become much more engaged. For example, in Syria, causing huge instability across yeah. Europe in terms of the migration crisis. Yeah. Are there any contingency plans that are being worked for that at this point? Uh, I think the the Middle East. Uh, it must be more the territory for the coalitions, uh, U.S. led than the than the EU as such. That's uh, a factor that needs to be taken into consideration. But um, how to define the counter-terrorism operation? For example, if I look our naval operation in Mediterranean, Operation Sophia, in the way it's 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 also a counter-terrorism operation because they are they are looking after the Ill, Ill, looking after the illegal migration and and there's also that element present all the time. So there's once again, this is not uh, about the naming naming of the operation, but it's more on, on nature nature of the operation and your actions. So, just to clarify, with the Brits, do you want to create sort of side agreements that help the the UK sort of more directly engage? What's the right way to do that, given that you are losing some key British talent from your staffs? Well, actually, unfortunately, this is not my my responsibility. But uh, I look from the practical military point of view. I look the look after the uh, UK's contribution in my staff, in operations, missions, and also the military capabilities that have been provided for, for at the EU's disposal. And, uh, and uh, I don't know how they are going to do that. Of course, that depends on the member states and their will. Uh, but uh, but certainly, certainly, personally, I, and military perspective, I do hope that the UK will stay committed, committed to the European defence. Finnish Army Lieutenant General Asa Polkinen, the Director General of the EU Military Committee. Sir, thanks very much. It was great talking to you. Thank you. Thank you very much.